The Canon 90D has been out since October. The Canon Rebel 8Ti will be available in April. Trying to decide if the power of the 90D or the Rebel gives you everything you need? Stay tuned, I'll give you the information to help you decide. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. It's Simon from The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button, and all the links to everything I talk about in this video are in the description down below. The Canon Rebel 8Ti and the 90D come with a Digigate processor. Startup time is fast, LCD and other controls are fast and responsive, and this is a big for the ordinary filmmaker that needs to capture moments as they happen. Have a child and want to capture them in action? Well, set the camera to full auto and it's ready within a second. Shooting sports or fast action photography needs at least 7 frames per second to produce good results. The Rebel is more than adequate as a starter camera for sports photography. 7 frames per second captures the shots you need and the autofocus nails the shot most of the time. The 90D up to 10 frames per second mechanical, though the viewfinder increases your odds of capturing the perfect shot over the Rebel and with increased accuracy. But both cameras have limited time to refocus between shots. Not every shot will nail focus on either camera. The 90D with its faster shutter and improved autofocus increases the probability that you'll be more successful with the 90D than with the Rebel. If you're serious about fast action photography, be aware that the buffer allows for 85 JPEG and 25 RAW photos before filling. Good for most people and most situations. It's great for water skiing, running, car racing, and so on. But if you're serious about getting into sports photography or plan to make a living from your shots, there are better cameras like the 1DX Mark III, 5D Mark IV, and the Sony a7 IV. More, ex more expensive cameras for sure, but if you plan to make a living from sports photography, you are competing against a field of photographers and neither the 90D or the Rebel will compete well in this field. But it's a good starter camera. I've been shooting photos for 25 years for personal use. Seven frames per second is what I consider the minimum bar to get the shot. I've used it for water skiing, car racing, and amateur sports. Either of these cameras satisfy my needs for fast action and should work for most, most ordinary filmmakers. Dual pixel autofocus is used in live view providing almost complete coverage. Dual pixel is the only option for video and considered by many, including myself, to be the best focusing system on the market for video. It's reliable, trustworthy, and it doesn't hunt. I'm using the 7 year old 70D for this channel and I leave it on autofocus because it just never misses. The 90D does have better autofocus than the 80D and has eye detection. I still prefer to use the viewfinder for photos, but perhaps it's because I grew up shooting that way. I find shooting photos through the viewfinder to be unnatural, sorry, through live view to be unnatural. Sure, the autofocus is good, but I'm okay with that trade off, but for video, the flip screen live view is amazing. The ability to tap and pull focus or to consistently change your focus by moving your finger across the LCD is just amazing. In face detection mode, the 90D will prioritize the closest face, but you can drag your finger around and it will shift focus instantly on the viewfinder. The 90D may not be the most feature rich camera, but it excels in ease of use across all camera capabilities. I can put the 90D down for a few months pick it up and still be able to navigate through the menus and find what I need. Ease of use is very important to me. I define the ease of use as being able to use a camera to navigate capabilities with little to no training. Both cameras provide 4K, 1080, and 720 resolutions for video. The 90D provides standard frame rates of 24, 25, and 30 frames per second in 4K. The Rebel doesn't include 30 frames per second in 4K. I won't go into a ton of detail here as this video covers frame rates in detail, so here's a high level summary. 24 frames per second gives a more cinematic look by creating motion blur. 30 frames per second captures life more as it happens. So what's more important to you? A dreamy look or more true to life? To simplify, documentaries shoot 30 frames per second most of the time, capturing life realistically. Hollywood movies generally shoot at 24 frames per second. 24 frames per second also takes up less storage space, about 12 to 15% less space than 30 frames per second. If you shoot in both 30 and 24, that means the Rebel will not work for you, but if you shoot in 24 or 25 and don't need 30, the Rebel is a very good option. 
Look at my earlier video about frame rates where I take more time to explain when to use which frame rate. It's an earlier video, so the quality is not top shelf, but it has all the necessary information. Whatever you shoot today, it's nice to have the option to change your frame rate. I started filming in 24 frames per second, then switched to 30, and now I'm going back and forth between 24 and 30 depending on the project. Both cameras produce good detail in 4K and 1080. Color is captured at 8-bit 420 and looks good. Detail is good, but not great. Want really good detail 1080 video? Shoot in 4K and then downsample. Downsampling creates a better, more detailed image because 4K has four times the amount of information as 1080. Downsampling isn't complicated. In your computer's editing software, set up the project as 1920 by 1080. Then import your 4K video into your editing software, and your software will do all the work for you, creating a much sharper video than you would if you had a shot it in 1080. Shooting in 4K means larger files, true, but it shouldn't be unmanageable. The 90D and Rebel both shoot using the IPB compression, resulting in much smaller files, about a third the size of all I. However, if you're going to do a lot of color grading effects, this might start to go sideways, but for most scenarios, you're going to be very happy with the results. While 4K makes great 1080, 4K video itself is soft compared to other cameras, so it does not work very well as a master file. This matters if you like to crop or zoom in. I often shoot 4K and crop into the image to create a more dynamic scene without having to move the camera or reframe. I just talked about downsampling 4K into a 1080 project and said that it creates very good detail. But if I wanted to zoom into that 4K video, the image would start to get soft and I would lose detail. The 90D provides more detailed 4K video if you're willing to accept a 1.2 crop factor, but this will cause the camera to heat up and won't be something you could use very well for YouTube, but would be fine for run and gun where you're just shooting short clips. The 90D offers up another advantage over the Rebel when shooting 4K. The 90D provides full sensor readout, so there's no additional crop on top of the 1.6 crop already provided by the APS-C sensor. If having detailed 4K is important, I suggest looking at the Sony 6400 or the Fuji X-T4. Both of these cameras cost more than either the Rebel or the 90D, but provide a much more detailed 4K and offer several film simulation modes. Additional detail can be had by recording externally over the HDMI port on both the 90D and the Rebel. The quality increases as both cameras output from the sensor directly and provide 8-bit 422 instead of 8-bit 420. But external recorders can easily set you back $600 or more if kitted out. Slow motion is an excellent filmmaking technique. I just love it. Any frame rate over your standard frame rate is considered slow motion. If your project frame rate is 30 frames per second, then 60 frames gives you a two times slow motion. 120 gives you four times slow motion. 120 frames per second is where the magic happens. 120 slows down the scene, providing very smooth motion. Great for when you want to focus on your subject. It's also very effective at stabilizing video in a shaky environment, such as horseback riding or car racing. The Rebel tops out at 60 frames per second, while the 90D offers 120 frames per second. Unfortunately, Canon's cripple hammer struck, locking the focus. Some channels write off 120 on the 90D due to the lack of autofocus. Tech Gear Talk says the image quality is very good. There is no continuous autofocus, no image stabilization, and no audio in this mode, and the lack of autofocus makes this feature almost useless. Tech Gear Talk is not alone in this opinion. As YouTubers, we are not perfect, and sometimes we are a little harsh on cameras, and sometimes we make mistakes. 120 is not almost useless, far from it. The 90D produces very good slow motion. There is a simple workaround to the lack of autofocus. Shoot at a higher f-stop. A higher f-stop increases the depth of field. Most of the frame stays in focus. Try setting an f-stop to 8 or higher and you'll be pleasantly surprised. Second, I don't understand how the lack of stabilization is an issue in 120. The very nature of 120 frames per second smooths out the video, making the need for stabilization a moot point. Sure, autofocus would be nice, but play with the f-stop and I think you're going to get great results. The 90D and Rebel do not provide in-body image stabilization. Image stabilization is a must for video scenarios and useful for shooting photos with longer exposures. 
While the 90D and Rebel do not have in-body image stabilization, Canon has a large lens library with image stabilization that provides good results. Not as good as what the Panasonic GH5 provides though, but even with great IBIS, learn the basics of filming. Know how to hold a camera, stabilize using a tripod, bracing yourself, or framing up against a solid object like a wall will help you improve your output. This video here describes three simple ways to stabilize your video footage with the camera or lens stabilization not available. Again, this is one of my earlier videos so the audio is not top shelf. My favorite, go anywhere, general purpose lens for video is the 18 to 135 USM. For photocentric users, the 18 to 135 USM is my favorite general purpose lens for these cameras. It is stabilized and has a quiet focus motor. The USM provides sharper, more detailed photos than the STM, but the older USM, it has a focus motor that can be heard in video mode and is very distracting. However, the new USM lens is silent. You will not hear the focus motor and you'll be able to pull smooth zooms. The 18 to 135 is what I use 90% of the time for run and gun work on my 70D. This should be your first lens. It's more expensive than the uh, default 18 to 55 kit lens, but if you go with that, you'll regret your purchase within a year. The 18 to 135 is my travel lens, go anywhere lens. If you can only have one lens and you're not doing YouTube work, this should be it. For YouTube or studio work, I have two lenses. The 51.2 is the lens that I use. I love the quality and wide open aperture, but it is expensive and you'll need a large room or you'll be too zoomed in. I am shooting with it right now and the camera is 10 feet away from me. A much more affordable lens is the 24mm f2.8. It can be had for $175 or less. It's better for small studios and still produces good background blur. Both cameras use EF and EFS glass, so if you buy a Rebel, you can migrate your glass to the 90D when you upgrade or even to the EOS RF system. Canon has a deep inventory of EF glass, so take time to review what is out there. However, if your roadmap does include you moving to the RF system someday, try to stick with EF lenses as they will work much better on the RF system. If you're starting out, developing a roadmap can help put you over the edge with a particular brand. Lenses are more important than chasing the right body. So is the direction of the manufacturer. Both the Rebel and the 90D are DSLRs. Canon is focusing its development on the RF system. They have stated that they will no longer be developing the EF mount unless there is sufficient demand. They will continue to make existing lenses but have no intention of developing new lenses like the RF 28-70 or the RF 100-500 for the EF mount. There are plenty of EF and EFS glass available, but the RF system is where the exciting things are happening. Canon has de not developed, Canon has released 10 RF lenses since 2018 and they have plans for another eight in 2020 with two extenders. This does not make the 90D or the Rebel bad choices. Just do your own research and build your own roadmap. The 90D with the 18 to 135 costs $1,599. You can also get the 18 to 135 in kit form for the Rebel as well, but pricing isn't available for the T8i yet. But the 7 or the T7i is available for $1049. Both cameras feel good in the hand. The 90D and the Rebel are comfortable to hold having a deep grip. Good for people with large hands, but if you've never had a dedicated camera for before, this is going to feel heavy at first. I stopped noticing the weight once I started seeing the results, and I shoot with a heavier lens than the 18 to 55. But if the 1.5 pounds seems a little heavy for the body alone, and the 2 pounds or more with the lens, consider the Rebel instead. It's almost a pound lighter or 214 grams. The 90D beats out the Rebel when it comes to operating weather. The 90D is weather sealed. We're often caught shooting in the rain or snow. Weather sealing gives us the confidence that our hard earned investment will not be destroyed by some moisture. However, the 90D is weather sealed, but the EF lenses are not. And all the kit lenses, including the ones I recommended in this video are EFS, except for the 51.2 that I recommended. But you should be okay as long as you're not in a torrential downpour. I've been shooting outside with my 70D for seven years. Most recently, I shot this video and it was minus 11 Celsius outside, which is about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. The wind was around 25 miles an hour or 40 kilometers. The snow melted when it touched the camera. 
I did not stay outside long because the moisture would eventually find its way inside. But this is not the only time I've shot in harsh conditions. There was this time, and this, and of course this time. These cameras are well built and hold up well. Just take precautions. Before going out in the cold, cool down your camera slowly, and when you bring it back inside, warm it up slowly and keep it off for about 30 minutes. Warming it up quickly can lead to condensation forming on the inside and shorting it out. Same with the rain. I've taken my 70D into some pretty harsh conditions. I've taken it to Niagara Falls. You can see the rain hitting up against the camera. We were all getting soaked. I felt like we were on the outer edge of a hurricane, so I took some precautions. I wrapped the camera in plastic, only exposing the outer part of the lens, which had a lens protector. I did this several times. I never had any breakdowns. While I wish I had a weather-sealed body, it is possible to protect your gear and minimize the risk of damage. How will you use your camera? Do you need weather sealing, or are you willing to take a risk or chances like me? If you'll be shooting outside a lot, if this is your go-anywhere general-purpose camera, and you have the budget, Consider the 90D over the Rebel. Battery life is excellent for both of these cameras. A single battery is usually enough to get through the day, but I like to keep a few spare just in case I end up shooting a lot of video. Battery replacement is good for both cameras, allowing the battery to be changed without having to remove the camera from the tripod. The Rebel uses the LPE17 battery, while the 90D uses the LPE6N. I love the LPE6N. This battery is used everywhere. It's used on the EOS R, the 5D, 6D, and many other cameras. Upgrading to the EOS R or RP later? No problem. Those batteries will follow you. I wonder what the battery will be in the R5 or the R6. I suspect there might be a change, but who knows? It could still use that same old battery. The 90D has digital image stabilization, as does the Rebel. But don't use this. Please, just don't. I don't want to tell you I told you so. In-body image stabilization and lens stabilization use hardware to stabilize the video and work very, very well. Digital stabilization uses in-camera software. It can work well, but when it doesn't, it creates a warping effect which is very unpleasant, and there's just no way to fix it or undo it. If you're going to use this feature, check the video before you finish your shooting. The biggest reason not to use this is that most editing software do provide you with image stabilization, so do it in post. If the video messes up, you can undo it, try the settings, and redo it for better results. I'm not going to get into the massive crop factor you get when using digital or enhanced image stabilization because I just don't recommend it. Please stay away. You can still stabilize your video, just use lenses with stabilization or other techniques found in this video, like using a tripod or bracing to reduce camera shake. The use of a tripod adds extra weight to the camera body, causing it to be less jerky. I had my hands on the 90D yesterday. I was shooting some B-roll to close out this video, and I almost bought the camera, even though I plan to get the EOS R5 or R6 when they come out. I may still get the 90D later this year or next year and use it primarily for my channel, and use the R5 as my general purpose run and gun camera. The 90D, it's not an entry-level camera, the Rebel is, but Canon has put so much into it that as an ordinary filmmaker or photographer, it will take you years before you outgrow the camera. You can run a YouTube channel. You can film run and gun work in all sorts of weather. The Rebel T8i is a great camera, but this is so much more. If saving for six more months means that you'll have the 90D over the T8i, you won't be disappointed. But don't let me get you hyped up. I always believe that you should do your own research and come up with your own roadmap. And also consider what other APS-C cameras in this class have to offer, like the newly announced X-T4 or the Sony A6400. Or even consider jumping up to the EOS R. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box. Show more box or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.